Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're so excited to get this uh, conversation started and uh, a lot of these great activities started tonight. So um, if you're joining us today, we're going to be uh, talking about connecting. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. So Julissa's dog was, that's okay, Julissa. Julissa's dog was saying hello to everyone. <laughs> I'll take over and then we'll get started. Um, I'm Deborah Albesteiger. I'm CEO of Children's Bereavement Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're so happy to have uh, Rebecca and Greg with us. Uh, why don't I just let them introduce themselves and then we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. And I was, my dogs are outside and they're confused because I came home and then ignored them. And so I'm just glad it wasn't mine. <laughs> but I am a Becky. I'm a dietitian and yoga instructor and have been for around a decade, a little, little over. Um, worked with a variety of populations. Right now I work with everything from college students to um, different pockets of communities in Western North Carolina. That's where I live. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here talking about nutrition. I'm so happy to have you here. And I, I just, I was just letting them introduce themselves, Julie. So don't worry about it. Hopefully puppy's all okay. Um, Greg, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, my name is Greg. I'm with an organization called Yoga for Change. Um, and we are an organization that provides uh, trauma-informed yoga. Uh, we work with a variety of populations. Uh, we work with uh, justice impacted folks, with veterans. Uh, we work with uh, anyone who's really having issues with uh, behavioral health, mental health. That can be anything from grief to um, people who are dealing with chronic illness to people who are in uh, recovery centers. And we also work with youth. So we're really expanding the uh, definition of, of trauma. Anybody who has been dealing with anything, um, you know, that has had significant impacts on their lives. And we look at the way that this indigenous South Asian practice can help uh, support us through those, through those tough periods. So I'm Thank happy you. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you so much, Becky. I really apologize, everybody, <laughs> for the interruption. That shouldn't happen again. But thank you. I was about to introduce Greg and Becky. I'm glad that they've already introduced themselves. And you'll hear a little bit more from them and, and their specialty. And we'll have some great uh, yoga, chair yoga moves from Greg later on as well. So I am also Joan Julissa. I am the Director of Programming for the Children's Bereavement Center. And uh, before we get started, just in case you haven't heard of the CBC and the work we do, um, just let me tell you a little bit about how we got started. So the Children's Bereavement Center was started almost 25 years ago. Next year will be our 25th year. And we were started initially to work with children, but we expanded our services to work with families, with adults who are grieving, who have experienced the loss of a loved one. And we have national um, grief experts um, and professionals, mental health professionals that are part of the of our team, of our amazing facilitators that are part of our group and help grievers really process that um, grief and uh, loss. Um, through the group experience. We serve Miami-Dade, Broward and Palm Beach, but really all over the country nationwide. Our participants are able to join in our groups and really take part and share in their experience. We also continuously develop free resources, uh, free grief resources that can be found on our websites. And we'll go over that later on, just so you have that information. Um, and it's just really great information for our community um, about grief, anything related to laws and how um, we can help support you or how you can help support anybody else who's grieving. So today's topic is very important and specifically for um, it associated with, with, grief, with grief and how the impact of grief, how grief impacts us and physically, 
and our diet as well. So that's why we have these great people here tonight that will talk a little bit more about that. And so just a little summary as to why um, we're talking about the physical impact of grief. We really have to touch on how grief is a not just a complex emotional response due to the death of someone, but it's also something that we feel physically. It impacts us, it impacts our diet, it impacts our sleep. So there's this physical and mental health connection when we experience grief and loss. So it really, research shows that there's a significant relationship between the two and examining these impacts, it can lead to a deeper understanding of the of individuals as a whole, especially when we're trying to process something that is very traumatic to us. There's a lot of unaddressed grief that can impact our mental health and therefore can impact our physical health. And we have a lot of physical symptoms that we'll kind of go over of how grief um, shows itself. There are also some very helpful um, coping mechanisms that we can implement to help manage these physical symptoms of grief. So one of the symptoms a lot of people can think of emotional uh, challenges that people who are grieving experience is of course anxiety, um, which is that intense worry and fear. And a lot of us really can feel that, uh, that anxiety when we feel restless, we can feel that muscle tension, we can feel that shortness of breath or any type of headache or stomach ache. We can feel that anxiety within our body. We can also feel that depressive, that depression in our bodies as well, that despair, um, and it, give, it just prevents us from enjoying the daily activities that we used to enjoy. And of course, the major, major sleep disturbances, that's such a huge factor in um, how we feel, how we cope. So if you're fatigued, if you're tired all the time, all the time, if you have insomnia, um, that has huge impact on our body. So um, our uh, mental health symptoms often have that, those physical symptoms, right? And they can in, impact your heart rate, your blood pressure, your immune system. It can also lead to chronic stress. And um, the relationship between our body and mind, we need to continue to work on those relationships to make sure that we have uh, we're strengthened that relationship and we're able to observe our body, observe ourselves and see how we're feeling today. And the more we connect these two, the more we work at it, it can help us understand what needs a little more attention, a little more love. There are also some roles that hormone play in our grief. So grief can lead to fluctuations in hormones such as stress hormone, as a stress hormone cortisol. So when we're feeling strong emotions from our loss, our bodies release these hormones um, and it communicates a lot of stress. There's prolonged elevation in this hormone. It just has general negative impact on our health. So I, um, you can see some examples of how grief physically manifests itself, aside from the ones I've mentioned, the fatigue, the inflammation all over our body. Um, there's a weakened immune system. There are changes in appetite and cardiovascular changes as well. And it's important to consider our, our early interventions and positive coping strategies, which uh, Becky and, um, and our presenters today will go over and how to improve the quality of life when it comes to that. I won't expand so much on the nutrition because I think Becky has such a great presentation that will talk a little bit about uh, nutrition, but I do want to talk a little bit about the nutritional impact of grief. So um, we're, we may not be getting uh, the nutrition as we're really focused on our emotion, on our grief, 
Um, I think uh, when I first spoke to Becky, she had this kindness first approach. And I think that's such a beautiful thing that that's where we start thinking about mindful eating, um, about gathering some community resources and establishing routines that will help us as we navigate the challenges of grief and um, health and nutrition. There are also some warning signs that you want to be mindful of when we think about our physical and mental health. So, of course, a lot of um, that grief experience is normal to experience different types of things that happen to our body, our, our mind, our emotions after we experience a loss. We say here at CBC, grief is an individual response. Everybody processes and handle it, handles grief differently. And so that means even physically, um, we are experiencing these, these symptoms. So be mindful of the of the fatigue of changes and fluctuations in weight um, are you feeling a little bit more pain in certain areas of your body are you having a little bit more headache is it is there a difference between um how you're feeling now as you're grieving um as to how you were feeling before the loss of kurt um and and of course we want to be mindful of any mental health symptoms um, any prolonged symptoms of sadness and despair that we may experience is going to have an overall impact on our bodies and ability to really um, grow and expand and sort of move forward from, with our grief. So, you know, seeking the right support, whether it's a support group, individual counseling, or some creative ways to establish, to connect with your body and also to establish a sense of safety and support for yourself while you're grieving. That's important, establishing that routine. And, it, and you know, when we talk about physical activity, it doesn't have to be something that is super, you know, strenuous. It can be a simple walk, it can be something you do for 10 to uh, 15 minutes a day. It's just a way for you to get your body moving and to connect with yourself. And mindful practices are so important. Um, they really help us be more aware of our triggers and help maintain really great um, nourishing, uh, help us make good decisions about how we're nourishing our bodies and taking care of our bodies. So I'm going to pass it on to Becky so she can continue really speaking more about nutrition and how that how, ways to help um us for grieving thank you awesome thank you and that was a great intro i feel like it really aligns with kind of my principles and beliefs around nutrition and taking good care and um so i appreciate that and everybody can see this okay Yes, Becky, we see it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I uh, already introduced myself. I work for <laughs> too many jobs, but I have a private practice called Cultivate W and C, and we work privately with clients. And the website and resources will be on the last slide there too. I hope to leave some room for questions and give everybody a chance to ask questions or discuss. So I will try to keep my talking to somewhat of a minimum and keep an eye on time. But I do like to look at everything through kind of the lens of kindness, as Julissa mentioned, which, you know, some days we might be able to feed ourselves at, I don't know, what we consider to be well or ideal. And then sometimes we have more difficult days or bad days where it gets more challenging. So I do think at the end of the day, we have to think about what is going to be most kind to ourselves. And sometimes life happens and we have to hit a drive through. And I think that, you know, it's not ideal, right? But also beating ourselves up over what we choose to eat or, you know, um, if we skip a meal or whatever it is, uh, you kind of just have to, to give yourself a little bit of grace because there is no perfect diet. I have heard everything under the sun. Everybody is very individual when it comes to nutrition and their needs and how they handle things like grief. So yeah, be give yourself some grace along the way. And mindfulness and mindful eating, I put some overlays here. It's really just, I think of mindfulness as being present, right? With what is coming to you, either externally or internally, 
without any judgment um, or criticism, which that's probably the hardest part, at least for me. Um, and including some balance and acceptance of those choices or whatever's going on and just being aware of the present moment. And then if we put that towards food, we can become aware of the positive and nurturing aspects of food. Um, and then also allowing ourselves to be okay with our likes, our dislikes of food. Um, if there's a behavior that we're engaging with in food and we, we know it's not ideal for ourselves, I think the best way to approach that is just to look at it more carefully, become aware of it, almost like as if you were observing that behavior with a friend, because we're usually easier on our friends than ourselves. And then another thing you can do is just to be more aware of your appetite um, and physical hunger. So I see that as two-sided. So we have this physical need to eat, which everybody experiences a little bit differently. But if we're under fueling or we're not eating consistently, we might experience lightheadedness or dizziness, stomach upset. I hear nausea and reflux a lot, um, when, especially if people aren't eating earlier in the day. And then it just becomes kind of a spiral, right? Of like, well, I didn't eat and so now I'm nauseous and now it's hard to eat. And that's the very physical side. Um, and then it could also affect our emotions. I think most commonly we hear the term hanger, right? Um, of feeling like a little out of sorts because we haven't eaten regularly. And then there's another side, which is our appetite and our desire to eat. And this is that social emotional component where it might be reaching for ice cream or, or french fries for me <laughs> of like, if something is not going well, I might have the desire to eat something that you know, isn't a salad or whatever we consider, you know, healthy. Um, so I do truly believe there's no good and bad foods. And it's more of figuring out, you know, the, the balance and the variety of a diet. And I think when experiencing grief or really any kind of heightened state or upset state, the appetite piece is what gets really challenging. So if we're not eating, that physical hunger is probably still there right? Like somewhere, at least if we've missed that window of physical hunger, we know like some of those negative symptoms on this, on this slide can appear. But then the desire might go down because, or might go up to eat something like ice cream or french fries. Um, and, and so kind of balancing the two, and I think relying on both sides of this equation of hunger um, can be quite helpful to just explore again with kindness. I love this tool. This is something that I give to, gosh, I think every client I've ever worked with, I'm some variation of this, which is to just, it's a gentle way to look at, you know, under overfueling and, and keeping our hunger and satiety in some sort of a regulated state, or just being aware of where it is. If we don't feel like we can eat for whatever reason, we maybe still be able to look at a scale like this and kind of figure out, oh, what, like what went on today and why am I at a zero or why I'm at a 10? What happened before? What led up to it? Um, I've had clients put this in a place where they can see it, you know, visibly. And it, I think if someone, I work with a lot of people that have trouble tapping into hunger cues because of things going on. And so I think this can be a good visual reminder of kind of where we are, where we want to be. And I think about that window of three to four as the time to eat and seven to eight as satisfied and, and maybe the time to stop. That doesn't mean that we're never going to be at a zero. We're never going to be at a 10. We have Thanksgiving coming up for those who celebrate that, you know, feel like that's sometimes lead to, to a 10 or um, we might be get to a 10 if we're at a zero all day. I feel like I see that a lot in my profession where it's this under fueling all day or um, for whatever reason, busyness, grief, anxiety, whatever it is. And then there's this pendulum swing kind of at the end of the day where your body has probably been under fueled and then it kind of is biting back a little bit and there might be a 10 um, because something feels uncontrolled or um, maybe there's like cupcakes in your break room and you're at a zero all day. So of course those cupcakes look a lot better. <laughs> your body is like, yes, sugar is fast fuel. Um, so I think, again, it's my favorite tool. If you want to use it, 
go for it. I call it my meal plan. When someone asks for a meal plan, I'm like, let's work on regulating hunger and satiety. And then, so I guess before I move on to some just nutrition recommendations, I do want you to think about the mindful eating components and the hunger and satiety and eating consistently, because I think I can tell you, you know, what's going to help your body um, as far as fuel. But then there's also that, again, that kindness piece and mindfulness piece where there's a lot of room for growth there. That doesn't mean you have to feel guilty when you're not doing some of the things listed on these slides. But if you're not eating consistently, your blood sugar can drop. And that's where some of those negative symptoms can arise, like hanger, irritability. Um, and they can contribute to other negative mood symptoms like depression. Um, so some slow release foods, well, I'll give you a lot more foods to think about, but some on this slide are whole grains, um, like the carbohydrates that are rich in fiber is really what I think about. And then some uh, healthy fats can be kind of slow, healthy fats and proteins can be slow release and sustaining foods. And some of those can be easier than, you know, making a cooking for an hour and sitting down to eat a full meal. There's some kind of life hack things that we can talk about. But when I say eating consistently, I think of trying to eat every four hours, whether that is something small. Um, again, we can find balance even when like a small meal or a snack. It doesn't have to be something grandiose. Um, I think another thing is starting the day off with breakfast. Another thing I hear a lot is breakfast is really hard uh, for some people, which is also okay. So again, thinking about something small and balanced, and I have some ideas later on to get get started with, but that can help regulate your hunger for the rest of the day. So if there is a lot of anxiety um, happening, I think one of two things happens. It's like this, the desire to eat, that appetite piece goes completely away, or it might get really heightened and there's cravings for foods and things. So if we eat breakfast, it does really start us off for the rest of the day and can reg regulate both our metabolism, but also our blood sugar. Um, and again, those smaller portions can be really helpful if eating feels difficult for whatever reason, then relying on just some, some things you can have around in your bag, in your car, wherever. I mean, as a dietitian, I feel like we literally sprinkle food everywhere. It's like, I feel out of sorts when I don't have a few um, clementines in my bag. So having some things around and, and trying to, even if it's just a little bit at a time can be really helpful. Um, it also might help curb cravings for things like sweets, um, cookies and things that enter our day and our environment often, whether we want them to or not. Um, if we feel, if our bodies feel well fueled in that physical hunger space, then those cravings get a little softer. I'm not saying they might, they might still be there, um, but they can get a little softer because we've been fueling well. And then, I mean, it's like our grandmothers told us, <laughs> fruits and vegetables, they have vitamins, minerals, antioxidants that all help improve some of the symptoms that Julissa mentioned, like the inflammation piece, cardiovascular health. Uh, they really do help boost our mood um, and you can fit them in however you want to. And there doesn't, it, again, it doesn't have to be this, you know, you don't have to be a, a, like a professionally trained chef to be able to get them in. And if you struggle with likability of them, then I say just keep experimenting and trying th new things over time, but also really rely on the ones that you do like and focus on that first and then expand out. And usually for a portion of that, I think about like a, a fist typically or like a small bowl, handful, something like that. Foods that can leave us I, it's, it's interesting because usually um, they're the ones that some of us crave if we're in an emotional state or dealing with grief, but they can also make us feel more drained at the end of the day. And that would be those refined flour, refined carbohydrate based foods. And this says bread, but I want to make sure, you know, I don't mean all breads. <laughs> they're not all created equal. So thinking about 
you know, whole grain breads or sprouted grain breads. There's so many on the market now that are much better than when I first started as a dietitian. <laughs> um, so you can look, you know, try different things. I always tell clients, don't rule it out just because the first time you had it was not great. Uh, because the fiber and those foods, and they just have all their natural nutrients and whole grains, they just sustain us much longer. Um, and they're packed full of nutrients versus something like a Wonder Bread, I hate to call them out, but it's just really refined. And same thing with some crackers and, and bait. it says baked goods, but I think there's a difference, right, between like a brownie we make at home versus like um, a little Debbie or I'm from the South, so I always think about little Debbies. And then sugar sweetened beverages and snacks like soda and cookies, those things aren't going to last super long. And they'll honestly usually cause a little spike in blood sugar and then a crash. And that can affect our mood. And it also can affect our hunger, especially things like sodas. They might curb our appetite while we're drinking it. So there's a less of a desire to eat something whole. Again, on a bad day, you might have to rely on like a Gatorade or electrolyte beverage or something like that to kind of keep things going. And I think that's okay too. And there's some space for that for sure. Just some ideas for fueling appropriately. I feel like whether it's being busy or again, dealing with grief, heightened state, emotional regulation feels off. If you have something food, like some food that are like pre-prepped and readily available. And I even say clear containers because when you open your refrigerator and you see a clear container, it's you're less likely to throw out the vegetables that you just bought at the store. If they're ready, they, they're there, they're ready to eat, things like that. So, and they're pretty, like fruits and vegetables are pretty colorful and um, it just is easier to utilize them if they're ready to go put in something or to eat right away. Some things, I broke my hand recently, <laughs> I'd have surgery. I couldn't cook for too long. I thought I was gonna go a little a little nuts with that. And so one thing that I did every week was I batch cooked French lentils, half French lentils, half quinoa. It could be rice, doesn't have to be those ingredients. But what I did is I would put vegetables on top of it, my favorite dressing or olive oil and lemon, um, fresh herbs. It just tried to make it as easy as possible to kind of have something available for lunches, even dinners or a small snack. So I think batch cooking a uh, whole grain like that can be really helpful because you can kind of repurpose it throughout the next few days, make it taste a little different, and then you don't have to think so much about what you're going to cook. Another thing to do is you can keep nuts on hand, walnuts, almonds, or mixed nuts. I like walnuts and almonds because they're just, especially walnuts, like we know that they're really good for brain health. Um, so just a good thing to add to your snacks or your meals or whatever it may be. And then I think another thing is, you know, food budget is just tough right now. It's like something I hear every day. So there is this balance of figuring out, do I want to pay a little bit more for something that's already chopped or rinsed? and easier to use or it, you know if i can't afford that of course you know prepping it or chopping it yourself is going to take more time so that's a little bit of a balance thing there but you can rely on <laughs> with my hand i really got into like the carrot coins and the snow peas that are prepackaged and and rinsed and dipping those in hummus again it's like you can throw it in your bag and you're ready to go, you know, you have some options. And I think going really simple for harder days is, is better because you don't, again, you don't have to think about it. Here are some ideas for balanced snacks. So I think about picking kind of two, and then I have a other category because putting fruits and vegetables in wherever you can is always going to be good for our health. And then if you pick a protein and a fat and a carb or a carbohydrate, some of these overlap, but I think sticking to a couple of these things gives you something really balanced that again, you didn't have to take a lot of time to prep. It's just there, it's ready and you can eat it and it's available. And I have, again, a lot of clients that struggle eating consistently for whatever reason. And this is, you know, giving them some ideas for balanced snacks, I feel like is really helpful. Or if they're struggling to eat breakfast, again, very common, and it does kind of set the pace for the rest of our day. 
maybe something smaller like a snack is best to get things rolling. And then maybe on some days, just a bunch of those little snacks kind of throughout the day is also another option. And then, um, so I'll let you, and I'll let, uh, Julie, so you can share this out with them if you want, because I don't, I think it's nice to kind of have an idea of what to shop for. Thank you. Yeah. And then some days <laughs> we might need a frozen meal or something that's super easy. And so these are just some brands and different meals that a colleague of mine identified that have maybe slightly better nutrients or lower in sodium. Um, and for any kind of meal, I think about a balanced plate. So you can think about your frozen meal or whatever you're eating kind of in the same way. Is there vegetables there? Is there protein? Is there a kind of slow burning carbohydrate like a whole grain? And some of these meals have those. So again, you can take a look in the grocery store for these brands, or you can look just at the nutrition facts label. So I think about reducing sodium. I look at the fiber and things. And then I look, is it a laundry list of ingredients? Or are we going for like five ingredients? <laughs> and compare and contrast kind of what's available with what's affordable, those kinds of things. Added sugar is another one that I like to look for in packaged meals. And now, thankfully, it's separated out on the labels. It's pretty easy to see. And one thing, rule of thumb with that, with snacks or meals, is to go for seven grams or less of added sugar. We have a blog on our website. Uh, it has all kinds of different uh, ideas and things. I have uh, my business partners, a lot of them have small children, so they're very time crunched. So there's some cool resources on there for doing things quickly or pleasing the whole family, whatever it may be. But I think in our society um, today, we really like fast and easy is kind of always top of mind. So I put that there for if you want to check that out. And then this is my favorite graph because <laughs> it's like everything in life is these ups and downs and all arounds. And we go through phases and hard days and good days and taking good care of ourselves is the same, right? It's like some days it's easier than others. And I, you know, we may set all of these goals for our health, like eating consistently or whatever it is. And some days it just doesn't work. And I think that we have to, again, just be, approach it with kindness and patience and realize that there is going to be another moment where that could be possible. It doesn't have to be, well, this didn't work and I'm going to throw the towel in. Um, it, looking for that next possible moment and kind of navigating those ups and downs. And then I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for questions. I have a quick question. What are your feelings on intermittent fasting? Good one. Yeah, it's um, something I see more and more of. Uh, and I actually, I taught at a university, Western Carolina here. I had a couple students do their projects on it. So it's like, they really brought me up to date on research. But I think parts of it are natural. Like the sh shortest fast, I think, is like 12 hours. So that's really just a natural routine. If we're, if we're able to sleep well through the night, then it will, we're going to probably stop eating around like, I don't know, whatever time we eight, seven, eight, and then we wake up in the morning, seven, eight. So that feels very good to me. Like, um, then the problem I guess I see with it is some people I've worked with will use it to fast their busiest time of day, which is when we need to be fueling. So if, clients are using it as an excuse to skip meals or they think that they're doing a healthy thing by skipping meals during their busiest time or skipping breakfast because of intermittent fasting. That's where I'm like, well, maybe we should kind of widen that window. One thing I do, I recommended recently is I had a client that felt like she was overeating later in the day because of her intermittent fasting window. So I, I was like, well, why don't you eat earlier one day? And then do your fasting window the next day. How did you feel? How did it go? Did you not have that urge to overeat later in the day? 
So that's kind of, I don't, I think there's good things about it if it's not too restrictive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I feel like I talked really fast. Sorry. <laughs> Lanka? Yeah. Uh, only fruits. Is it a good breakfast? Only fruit? Um, it's nice to pair it with something that has protein. So like, and that could be whatever you like, but uh, easy things with fruit would be like Greek yogurt or cottage cheese even. Um, eggs. I'm a big fan of hard boiled eggs because they're just there and they're prepared. <laughs> so it just helps release that blood sugar way more slowly. And then the protein is going to help you sustain you a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, I would say you could round it out with some protein or put it in even another whole grain like oatmeal. Uh, with walnuts or something like that, but yeah. Thank you. Of course. I will say eating fruit is better than nothing. So it's like if the fruit is there and you want to eat it for breakfast, then I think that's a much better thing to do than just if, you know, I, skipping breakfast is so common for people. And I get it. It's, you know, some people really struggle with appetite first thing. I will say it'll change over time. So, you know, there could be a period where it is just fruit, but then that appetite might grow into something a little bit more well-rounded. Great. Thank you so much, Becky. We really appreciate that. That was great information and we'll share it along with everybody else. Um, and if you have any remaining questions, I don't know if you mind putting your contact in the chat, Becky, your sure. information so they can also ask you that if, if they have any remaining questions. But thank you so much. I hope that provided you some insight as to um ways to to nourish yourself um especially during such challenging times as as you're going through the grief process or experiencing anxiety again just be kind to yourself in that process thank you for that and now i'm going to turn it over to greg um actually going to pin you spotlight you for everybody um, Greg, thank you so much. He's gonna take it away with some amazing yoga. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thanks, Becky, for that great uh, presentation on nutrition. So um, can everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> All right. So I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what trauma-informed yoga is, how it's beneficial. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide my camera away so that you can see my full body and and kind of practice along with me tonight uh, we will be doing practice together i invite you to turn your cameras on sometimes it can be nice if we can see each other but of course if you want to keep your cameras off that's perfectly fine um, and you're also uh, welcome as we go through the practice, if anything comes up for you, like maybe you're, you're noticing different sensations in your body or anything like that, you're welcome to type that into the chat. Sometimes it's good to kind of get a sense that we're experiencing something together. So we are going to be doing something called trauma-informed yoga tonight. Um, has there anybody here who's taken a yoga class before? I'm sure a lot of us have at this point. Yeah, awesome. I know some of us are even yoga teachers, which is great. <laughs> um, so, you know, in a yoga class, in trauma-informed yoga, we use a lot of the same tools that you would find in a typical yoga class. We work with uh, bodily movements, uh, postures, we work with our breath, um, and we also work with sort of focusing our attention. Right? So those are the three main tools that we use in, uh, in our classes. 
And there's a growing body of research that yoga has just this great potential for helping us um, to either resolve some of the symptoms of trauma or, or help to um, sort of build our, our capacity when we're dealing with things like grief and trauma. So one of the main ways it, it does this, uh, Jalisa pointed out earlier the importance of maintaining the body-mind connection, right? So a lot of times our our emotions or our thoughts, you know, we can kind of get stuck in our thoughts and ruminating and, and you know, that can lead to things like anxiety and depression. Um, and one of the things we realize is that the, the body sort of reflects what's happening in the mind. And so by working with the body it can help us to kind of free ourselves from some of those uh, mental and emotional symptoms as well. So we do this uh, a couple of ways that this might differ from a typical yoga class. This is all about freedom and choice. Okay. So in a typical yoga class, you might be told to do things one way or another. We might be concerned whether or not we're getting things right. Um, in a trauma-informed yoga class, there is no wrong answers. <laughs> uh, this is really you doing the practice in a way that is meaningful for you, in a way that feels good to you, because it is all about building that body and mind connection, right? And every time we move our body, it's an opportunity for us to kind of uh, approach our experience with curiosity to, to help us to build that uh, connection. And as I said, so we're gonna work with different movements, different breath um, techniques, and then at the end, we'll do sort of a guided uh, relaxation. How does that sound? Does that sound pretty good? Yeah, awesome. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just move the camera away a little bit um, so that you can see me. Everything that we do tonight can be done in a chair. Um, I'm gonna be doing some things. Let's see how that works. I've never done this with a background before, so. All right, I think that's gonna work pretty well. It looks weird, I'm like a disembodied <laughs> person floating in space there. Um, so as we uh, go through the, the practice tonight, uh, again, I'm gonna just start with simple movements. Everything can be done with a chair, although you can't see my chair, it's here right underneath me. Um, and I'll do some things that are standing as well, but again, you're welcome to, to stay in your chair throughout. Okay. Greg, I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I, the background is a little bit challenging. You can take it off. I'm not yeah, sure if you prefer. I think I might do that. I think it might be better. Let me yeah. Mm -hmm. Figure that out real quick. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to do it? Um, yes, if you go to where you see the little video camera at the bottom left hand with its little stop video. So you're going to kick the little arrow that's there and it's going to tell you choose virtually. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right, I think this is going to be better. Thank you for recommending that. All right, so uh, why don't we start just by coming to a comfortable, steady position. Again, some of the things that we're going to work with tonight, we're going to work with presence. So we're going to draw ourselves into things that are happening in this immediate moment, whether it's things coming through our senses, sensations in our body. Um, and then we're going to be working with just a lot of, you know, different movements and, and kind of you embodying those movements however you'd like. So as you sit up tall, you can do this with your eyes either open or closed. Um, but if you are going to keep your eyes open, maybe just kind of look down into your personal space. And I invite you to just start to notice things that are happening in your immediate environment. Maybe we can start with, with sounds, just noticing the sounds of the space around you. You might notice some sounds that are further away, some sounds that are more close. You might, just, might notice some sounds are pleasant and some sounds maybe are less pleasant. And we just sort of allow ourselves to accept 
all things as they are in this moment. You may notice a tendency for your mind to wander. So thoughts might arise. You might find yourself getting distracted. If that happens, just every time you're aware of it, bring your attention back to something happening in the present moment. And as you feel yourself becoming more present, more aware of this moment, start to notice your breath. You don't need to change your breath at all, but simply draw your attention to your breath. Maybe notice its quality. Notice if it's high or low, maybe it's in your chest or in your belly. It might be shallow or deep. It might be smooth or disrupted. Just remember, there's no right or wrong way to do it. We're just becoming aware of things as they are. However, the breath is something that, as soon as we become aware of it, sometimes it changes all on its own. And if that happens, just allow it to do so. as you are noticing your breath, if you want to maybe put a word in the chat that describes what you notice about your breath, you're welcome to. Or if you want to just continue to breathe in and out, becoming aware of each inhale and exhale. Good. And then we're going to turn our attention towards uh, the sensations of the body. So maybe start by noticing your feet connected to the earth. Your hands are in your lap. Maybe noticing your hands touching your, your legs. You might notice your seat against the chair. If your back is leaning against the chair, you might notice that. We're gonna start with some nice, easy movements of the feet. Now, I know my feet aren't showing on screen, so I'm just gonna describe what I'm doing. But the first thing you can do is just kind of notice your feet connected to the floor, or maybe feel your feet in your shoes. And one of the things about grief and trauma is it can oftentimes leave us feeling very ungrounded, almost like we've had our feet swept out from underneath us. So I just want you to really feel that connection between your feet and the ground. Notice sort of all around the contours of your feet, maybe feeling the balls of the feet and the heels, arches of the feet, all of your toes. And then see if you can slowly start to shift your weight around on your feet. So maybe kind of rocking from the inside towards the outside of the feet. So again, you maybe can see my legs moving a little bit back and forth, but just know that I'm rolling my feet along the ground. And you could do this whether you have shoes on or not. And then maybe shift your weight from the front of your foot to the back of your foot. So you might sort of send your weight towards the balls of feet and toes, gently letting your heels lift. And then maybe rocking back towards your heels, letting your toes and the balls of your feet lift. Then just shifting your weight back and forth from the fronts of the feet to the backs of the feet. And as you do that, Try to notice how far up your legs do you feel sensation? Where are you noticing the sensation as you shift your weight from the front to the back of the feet? And then whenever you feel like you've had enough of that, just allow your legs to settle back into a neutral position. 
feeling your feet once again connected to the earth. Awesome. Now I'm gonna slide slightly forward on my chair and you're welcome to join me in that, just sitting in a way that feels stable and supported. But I'm taking my back away from the chair just because I'm gonna put a little bit of movement into my pelvis and spine. I'm also gonna hold onto the edges of the chair for some additional support and you're welcome to do that as well. And so as I'm sitting here now towards the edge of the chair, I'm just gonna start to tip my pelvis back and forth. And I invite you to do some type of movements in your pelvis. So I'm just going to sort of rock back on my pelvis and rock forward on my pelvis. And I just want you again, just kind of rocking back and forth. Notice that contact between your seat and the chair. And just kind of notice that little massaging action that you might get at the base of your pelvis as you move forward and back. And as you rock forward and back, see if you can notice what's happening in your spine. Right? What happens in your spine when you roll back on your pelvis? What happens in your spine when you roll towards the front of your pelvis? Are you able to feel anything at all through the spine? Again, there's no right or wrong answers. You can make these movements as big or as small as you'd like. Make them as fast or as slow as you like. Awesome. And then when you're ready, settle into a neutral position and see if you can feel the length of your spine. So all the way from your tail up towards your crown and feel the length of your spine. What I like to experiment with is, is sort of pressing down into my seat, getting a sense of like rooting down and feeling how that can support me or help me to sit a little bit taller. And as you settle into a nice, tall, neutral position, again, start settling into your breath, noticing where's the breath moving around your rib cage. Can you feel the breath moving in your belly? Do you notice the breath in your nose or throat. And then when you're ready, slowly release. So again, I'm gonna hold the chair. I'm gonna start this next one seated and then I'm gonna stand up. And you're welcome to join me when I stand up or you can stay seated, that's completely up to you. So for this one, we're gonna do is we're gonna draw the right leg up and then place it down and draw the left leg up and place it down. And again, you can notice this in any number of places in your body, but I'd like you to see what you feel in the top of your thigh as you lift the leg and lower it down. And you, again, if you, sometimes moving at different paces will bring different sensations. So you might feel sort of more by lifting it quicker or slower. And I encourage you to kind of play around with both until you get what feels best to you. And again, if you'd like to, you can do this standing up as well. So you can lift, lower, lift, lower. Good. And now we're going to work with balancing, right? So starting, if you're standing with both feet on the floor, if you're seated, also just kind of sitting up nice and tall with both feet on the, on the floor. If you're standing and you want to hold the chair, you can do that. What you'll feel is your weight shift towards one leg and just lift the opposite leg up and hold it. If you're seated, there's a couple of options here. You can try lifting this all the way up and placing the foot on the chair and seeing if you can kind of hug and sit up against that leg. Or you can sit and hold the edge of the chair and just hold the leg up in front of you. So whichever one of those choices feels best for you, 
harder is not always better, right? It's again, where do you feel most supported? Where do you get the most sensation from your body? And then when you're ready, whatever leg is in the air, you can place on the ground and then making a choice about what you'd like to do for your second side. So taking a moment to release that first side. And then when you're ready, lifting the second leg up to wherever you'd like it to be and maybe holding that pose. And then when you're ready, gently release. You can place that down. Awesome. Good, we're gonna come back into our seat. Just continuing up to move the spine just a little bit. We're gonna add in a spinal twist. And I encourage you to feel a little bit of a lift up into your heart when you can do this. Try and get some breath up into the chest. We're gonna take one hand and place it on the opposite knee and then turn to look back behind you. So almost like if you were reversing your, your car before we had all the backup cameras, uh, you would have to turn to look over your seat to to see behind you. And I want you to feel again, like that, that lifting up through the spine and notice the breath moving in the area of the chest and in the area of the heart. Maybe taking a few breaths here, focusing on that tall length of the spine, that expanse across the chest and collarbones. And then when you're ready, gently release. And we're gonna try the other side. So again, finding your neutral position and sitting up nice and tall, feeling lift in the heart, and then just start to turn to look over the opposite shoulder, breathing deeply and deeply. Again, we're trying to bring the body and mind together. So this is really about learning how to listen to the cues that your body gives you. So notice what feels good, what doesn't feel good. How does it feel for you to inhabit this shape? Does it have an effect on your breath? Do you feel any warmth in your body? You might even feel yourself uh, increasing your, your blood pressure, your heart rate. And then when you're ready, gently release. Also, if you wanna shake out your arms or shoulders, you could shake out your arms and shoulders. If you want to stomp your feet up and down on the ground a few times, stomp your feet up and down on the ground a few times. And then when you're ready, just start to settle back into your chair. So this is just a little bit of a taster of what a trauma-informed yoga class might look like. We're going to just finish with a short um, relaxation. Uh, before I do that, does anybody have any any questions or any kind of feedback about anything that they experienced as we're going through through those movements? And feel free to just pop your mic on if you do. Awesome. All right, good. So feel free to settle into a comfortable seated position. Again, this can be done with your eyes opened or closed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to guide us through a body scan. So I'm going to name different parts of the body. And as I name each body part, just allow your attention to move towards that area. If it feels appropriate to relax it, you can, right? But just bring your attention there is enough. And we're going to start at the feet, bringing your awareness towards the soles of the feet, gently relaxing the toes balls of the feet, the heels, the arches, the tops of the feet and the ankles, and the lower legs, around the knees, and the thighs. Become aware of your hips, tailbone, pubic bone, relaxing the inside of the pelvis. Becoming aware of your lower back, your mid back, upper back and shoulder blades. 
the sides of the waist, the sides of the ribs, and up under the arms. Become aware of your abdomen, your solar plexus, the front of the ribs, the collarbones. Just visualize your heart and your lungs. You can bring your attention to your hands, be aware of your palms and the backs of your hands and your wrists, your forearms and your elbows, your arms and shoulders. Just feeling along the tops of your shoulders to your neck and relaxing your neck. Becoming aware of the back of your head, the sides of your head, the top of the head, the forehead and your temples, your eyes and ears, cheeks and nose, lips, your chin and your jaw. Just feeling the whole body gently relax, gently relax, whole body gently relax. And as you feel ready, start to bring your attention back out to the space around you. Just noticing again the sounds of the room. Maybe taking a deep breath in and out. Bring some gentle movement back to your body in any way that feels good. You want to wiggle your fingers and toes, shrug your shoulders, maybe move your face, your nose, your lips, move your head from side to side, anything that helps bring you back. And then as you feel ready, gently open your eyes. Thank you all very much for your for your kind attention and your efforts towards uh, towards building that mind body connection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. That was amazing. I feel super connected. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. I'm actually going to turn it over to Deb right now. Our CEO. Yes, thank you, uh, Greg. That was amazing, and Becky, I, I, Becky saw that was that was incredible. Um, I'm so relaxed right now, Greg. I needed that. It's been a really busy day today, and it's a busy week for us. So thank you so much, and I look forward to hopefully working with both of you more in the future because we all need that during times of grief and stress, and it's just been wonderful. Um, just I know we're over on time, but it was well worth it because I'm going to be sleeping better tonight, <laughs> thanks to Greg, and hopefully eating better, <laughs> thanks to Becky. I, I I wanted to, first of all, if anyone is not familiar with CBC, and Lisa can put it up on the screen, or Amanda can put it in the chat, but we do offer grief support groups to those individuals who's lost, who've lost a loved one, and some of our participants are on the call today, so thank you for joining us. We want to make sure you know how to contact us and um, our groups are year round. They're for children, teens and adults. And for any loss, thank you, Amanda, for putting that in the chat so that people understand that we're here. And this is a, the reason we do our conversations with CBC is that this is very holistic, right? So we know that grief support, that having that social bond is really important. And we also know that taking care of our bodies, nutrition, focusing on wellness, these are all very important. So at CBC, we wanna make sure that our participants, our staff, um, our, our, just our community members are involved. So thank you very much. Uh, today is Children's Grief Awareness Day. A lot of people are uh, may not be familiar, but that's a day in which as a, as a country, we remember that there are many children who are grieving and their families and individuals. And it's also coincidentally Give Miami Day and I always do point out that um, because our services are free, we're always wanting um, to leverage support and give Miami Day a day to do that. So thankfully, we've, we've made some money this year today 
but um, I'm always going to to suggest for people to share with others in particular, if CBC is helpful for you, post about it. Just put, make a quick post. There's another five hours left of Give Miami Day and just say why CBC is important to you. And it's, it's important to every one of us in our own way. And we just encourage you to give on Give Miami Day and to tell people about CBC. So one, um, one referral can change somebody and we wanna make sure they do that. So I want to say thank you to everyone. I know it's late, Greg, Becky, that was awesome. I hope we can work together again in the future. I hope everyone was safe last night with that very odd hurricane that wasn't a hurricane. Um, and we're all here together and that's just beautiful. So thank you and I'll turn it back to Julissa. Thank you so much. Yes, um, thank you everybody for being here today. We're very grateful that you took the time to learn a little bit more about um, how grief impacts the body and just do some amazing movement today. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out, put my, my email in the chat. And that's it for today. Everybody have an amazing day. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Sleep well. <laughs> Bye.